Chapter 16 of The Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Victory. I had gone five miles and had paused for a moment halfway up the slope of the valley to get my bearings when a figure came hurtling through the air from behind and landed lightly at my side. It was Wilma. I put Bill Hearn in command and followed Tony. I won't let you go into that alone. If you die, I do too. Now don't argue, dear. I'm determined. So together we leaped northward again toward the battle, and after a bit we pulled up close behind the barrage. Great blinding flashes, like a continuous wall of gigantic fireworks, receded up the valley ahead of us, sweeping ahead of it a seething, tossing mass of debris that seemed composed of all nature, tons of earth, rocks, and trees. Ever and anon, vast sections of the valley sides would loosen and slide into the valley. And leaping close behind this barrage, with a reckless skill and courage that amazed me, our bayonet gunners appeared in a continuous series of flashing pictures, outlined in mid-leap against the wall of fire. I would not have believed it possible for such a barrage to pass over any of the enemy and leave them unscathed, but it did. For the Hans, operating small disintegrator beams from local or field broadcast, frantically bored deep slanting holes in the earth as the fiery tides of explosions rolled up the valleys toward them, and into these probably half of their units were able to throw themselves and escape destruction. But dazed and staggering, they came forth again, only to meet death from the terrible ripping, slashing, cleaving weapons in the hands of our leaping bayonet gunners. Thrust, cut, crunch, slice, thrust. Up and down with vicious, tireless, flashing speed swung the bayonets and axe-bladed butts of the American gunners as they leaped and dodged ever forward toward new opponents. Weakly and ineffectually, the red-coated Han soldiery thrust at them with spears, flailing with their short swords and knives, or whipping about their ray pistols. The forest men were too powerful, too fast in their remorselessly efficient movement. With a shout of unholy joy, I gripped the bayonet gun from the hands of a gunner whose leg had been whisked out of existence beneath him by a pistol ray, and leaped forward into the fight, launching myself at a red-coated officer who was just stepping out of a wormhole. Like a shriek of the Valkyrie, Wilma's battle cry rang in my ear as she, too, shot herself like a rocket at a red-coated figure. I thrust with every ounce of my strength. The Han officer, grinning wickedly as he tried to raise the muzzle of his pistol, threw himself backward as my bayonet ripped the air under his nose, but his grin turned instantly to sickened surprise as the upcleaving axe blade on the butt of my weapon caught him in the groin, half bisecting him. And from the corner of my eye, I saw Wilma bury her bayonet in her opponent, screaming in ecstatic joy. And so in a matter of seconds, we found ourselves in the front rank, thrusting, cutting, dodging, leaping, along behind that blinding and deafening barrage, in a veritable whirlwind of fury, until it seemed to me that we were exulting in a consciousness of excelling even that tide of destruction in our merciless efficiency. At last we became aware, but in a vague sort of way at first, that no more redcoats were rising up out of the ground to go down again before our swirling, swinging weapons. Gradually we paused, looking about in wonder. Then the barrage ceased, and the sudden absence of the deafening roll and the wall of light in themselves deafened and blinded us. I limped weakly toward the spot where, hazily, I spied Wilma, now drooping and swaying on her feet, supported as she was by her jumping belt, and caught her in my arms, just as she was sinking gently to the ground. All around us the weary warriors, crimson now with the blood of the enemy, were sinking to the ground in exhaustion, and as I too sank down, clutching in my arms the unconscious form of my warrior wife, I began to hear through my helmet phones the exultant report of headquarters. Our attack had swept straight through the enemy's sector, completely annihilating everything except a few hundred of his troops on either flank and these, in panic and terror, had scattered wildly in flight. We had wiped out a force more than ten times our own number. The right flank of the American army was saved, and already the Colorado Union, from behind us, was leaping around in a great circling movement, 
closing in on the Han force that was advancing from the ruins of Lotan. Far away to the southwest, the southern gangs, reinforced in the end by the bulk of our left wing, had struck straight at the enveloping Han force, shattering it like a thunderbolt, and at present were busily hunting down and destroying its scattered remnants. But before the Colorado Union could complete the destruction of the central division of the enemy, the despairing Han saved him the trouble. Company after company of them, knowing that no escape was possible, lined up in the forest glades and valleys, while their officers swept them out of existence by the hundreds with their ray pistols, which they then turned on themselves. And so the fall of Lotan was accomplished. Somewhere in the seething activities of those few days, San Lan, the heaven-born emperor of the Hans in America, perished, for he was heard of never again, and the unified action of the Hans vanished with him, though it was several years before one by one their remaining cities were destroyed and their populations hunted down, thus completing the reclamation of America and inaugurating the most glorious and noble era of scientific civilization in the history of the American race. As I look back on those emotional and violent years from my present vantage point of declining existence in an age of peace and goodwill toward all mankind, they do seem savage and repellent. Then there flashes into my memory the picture of Wilma, now long since gone to her rest, as, screaming in an utter abandon of merciless fury, she threw herself recklessly, exultantly into the thick of that wild, relentless slaughter, and my mind can find nothing savage nor repellent about her. If I, product of the relatively peaceful twentieth century, was so completely carried away by the fury of that war, intensified by centuries of unspeakable cruelty on the part of the yellow men who were mentally gods and morally beasts, Shall I be shocked at the bloodthirstiness of a mate who was, after all, but a normal girl of that day, and who, girl as she was, never for a moment faltered in the high courage with which she threw herself into that combat, responding to the passionate urge for freedom in her blood that not five centuries of inhuman persecution could subdue? Had the Hans been raging tigers, or slimy loathsome reptiles, would we have spared them? and when in their centuries of degradation they had destroyed the souls within themselves, were they in any way superior to tigers or snakes? To have extended mercy would have been suicide. In the years that followed, Wilma and I traveled nearly every nation on the earth which had succeeded in throwing off the Han domination, spurred on by our success in America, and I never knew her to show to the men or women of any race anything but the utmost of sympathetic courtesy and consideration whether they were the noble brown-skinned Caucasians of India, the sturdy Balkanites of southern Europe, or the simple spiritual blacks of Africa, today one of the leading races of the world, although in the twentieth century we regarded them as inferior. This charity and gentleness of hers did not fail even in our contacts with the non-Han Mongolians of Japan and the coast provinces of China. But that monstrosity among the races of men which originated as a hybrid somewhere in the dark fastnesses of interior Asia, and spread itself like an inhuman yellow blight over the face of the globe. For that race, like all of us, she felt nothing but horror and the irresistible urge to extermination. Latterly, our historians and anthropologists find much support for the theory that the Hans sprang from a genus of human-like creatures that may have arrived on this earth with a small planet or large meteor, which is known to have crashed in interior Asia late in the 20th century, causing certain permanent changes in the Earth's orbit and climate. Geological convulsions blocked this section off from the rest of the world for many years, and it is an historical fact that Chinese scientists, driving their explorations into it on a somewhat later period, met the first wave of the oncoming Hans. The theory is that these creatures and certain queer skeletons have been found in the Asiatic Bowl, with a mental superdevelopment, but a vacuum in place of that intangible something we call a soul, mated forcibly with the Tibetans, thereby strengthening their physical structure to almost the human normal, adapting themselves to earthly speech and habits, and in some strange manner intensifying even further their mental powers. Or, to put it the other way round, these Tibetans, through the injection of this unearthly blood, 
deteriorated slightly physically, lost the soul parts of their nature entirely, and developed abnormally efficient intellects. However, through the centuries that followed, as the Hans spread over the face of the earth, this unearthly strain in them not only became more dilute, but lost its potency, and in the end, the poison of it submerged the power of it, and earth's mankind came again into possession of its inheritance. How all this may be, I do not know. It is merely a hypothesis over which the learned men of today quarrel. But I do know that there was something inhuman about these Hans, and I had many months of intimate contact with them and with their emperor in America. I can vouch for the fact that even in his most friendly and human moments there was an inhumanity, or perhaps unhumanity, about him that aroused in me that urge to kill. But whether or not there was in these people blood from outside this planet, the fact remains that they have been exterminated, that a truly human civilization reigns once more, and that I am now a very tired old man, waiting with no regrets for the call which will take me to another existence. There it is my hope and my conviction that my courageous mate of those bloody days waits for me with loving arms. End of chapter 16 Recording by Alan Winterout Audio.boomcoach.com End of The Airlords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan